there is value that comes out of these forgotten communities. You know, um, they say that nothing good can come out of Parkland. Nothing good can come out of the West End. And, you know, Mr. White has, has done an excellent job of showing not only me, but so many other young people what the possibilities are by introducing us to artists and professionals, people from all over the world. And I think when people see this film, they will see what that does for the mind of a young person. Good evening. I'm Leon Wilson, President and CEO of the Museum of African American History in Boston and Nantucket. And this evening, we'd like to invite you to join a conversation in the development and direction of River City Drumbeat. I'm going to introduce Bishan Boston, who's our moderator. And let me tell you just a little bit about Sean, before I turn everything over to her for the rest of the evening. She's a founder and principal of Michonne Boston Group Limited, which provides consulting and strategic planning to media makers and organizations. Her clients' uh, projects include this document documentary itself, and she's been involved in many projects and also is a recognized producer, director, and she herself uh, has produced films and also is a recipient of uh, a number of awards. Among them, a history of black women at Oberlin College, which is now part of the collections of the New York Public Library. And she's also a recipient of the National Endowment and Humanities grant for her research. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to Michonne and she will then introduce our panelists and take you through the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. I've been an impact producer on this film for over a year. And I just wanna let you know, my last name is really not a coincidence on why I contacted the museum for this event. It's a homecoming of sorts. Um, my family and I are somewhat connected to the family in which the museum resides. And we're all looking forward to visiting a museum in the future, and hopefully that'll be the near future. So let's talk about drum lines. Okay, we're, I'm assuming a lot of you are in New England. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the drum line tradition, um, this is a tradition whose pulse comes from the African continent and through the transatlantic slave trade and other vessels was transplanted and transformed here in the Americas. Some of you have heard this heartbeat in Caribbean and Brazilian carnival. Drumline is best known to be a tradition of African-American marching bands and has become a phenomenon on the HBCU or historically black colleges and university campuses. It's the heartbeat of campus life, student life, alumni, the big game, and homecoming celebrations. The drumline tradition has grabbed the attentions of pop culture too. There's a namesake film called Drumline that was produced. Beyonce's famous Coachella tribute to HBCUs, which you can see on Netflix. And the legendary Super Bowl halftime show by the late great artist Prince featuring the Florida A&M University or FAMU drumline and marching band. For those of you who haven't had the drumline experience, you get, you're getting it here in River City Drumbeat. So let's start with our first clip for River City Drumbeat, Who Wants to Battle? Guess what I'm on? 
showcase the talents in with the love and shaking hands and you know that's, a, that's what it's all about. I like the adrenaline rush like knowing that you gotta like play to your full potential you gotta like bring up the competition. Oh uh, the battle um I would say we won. I mean hey it is what it is you know there really isn't a winner but there is a winner. <laughs> Oh my God. I know. That's why my first question is for Marlon. <laughs> Marlon Johnson, I know your sound person was like, oh my God. Um, Marlon, you've produced a number of music documentaries so, sure. and stories about music and music makers. What would you say are the joys and challenges of doing a music themed documentary like this one and others that you've produced? Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and thank the audience for uh, participating today. Um, I think the joy really comes from um, the intrinsic power of music. It's why I've chosen to mainly make films about music. Um, there is a transformative nature to music and in, in the arts in general, um, but especially music. Um, when we think about our back on our childhood, one of the first things we think of is the soundtrack to that and how songs can really bring that back. So, so for me, I've always had a deep appreciation for music. I think some of the challenges can, <laughs> with making new movie films, uh, films about music, um, oftentimes has to do with what you might not necessarily think, and that's uh, on the legal side. So, if you are doing a music, uh, film about music, about recorded music, really getting the clearances um, is always tricky. And you try and not have that influence the way in which you approach the film. You, you make it and then you go get the lawyers after the fact. You make the film that you want to make as a, as a, as a, as a storyteller. Um, with this one in particular, because there was so much drumming in it, um, you know, the recording itself was often challenging because like in that particular um, scene, the space was incredibly loud. And so our audio guys really had to, had to uh, adjust and make sure that they were picking it up clean, but also um, didn't go deaf in the process for the next uh, shoot, because that would do us no good. Um, and then lastly, we wanted in the film to juxtapose uh, the performances with a soundtrack that was uh, less percussive, uh, more ethereal, if you would, um, and we thought we struck that balance quite well. Mr. White, what were your reactions when um, this film team, Anne Flatte and Marlon Johnson, came to you and say, hey, we want to make a film about the River City Drum Corps. How did this how did this story evolve? Well, the story evolved over, evolved over time because I've been hearing this from, from Owsley from, you know, from years that we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And, you know, it was hitting and, you know, they would start it and stop it and crews would come in and, 
So I just I just played it off like I normally do things and just wait till it really happens so I don't get myself all hyped up and then get the children hyped up so that that when it happens, it happens. And then when it happens, it, it it's real and it's not something staged. I didn't want it to be be, you know, scripted so that when he showed up, it was like, here it is. We've talked about it. This is Marlon. Marlon's going to be here. Uh, everyone understood who Marlon and Ann were. They became a part of the family. So that became easy. It became real easy. And that is what made it uh, uh, a great, a great endeavor was that they became part of the family. And with that being said, it was just, just follow the script. They're going to be here. We're going to do what we normally do. And uh, you see what, you see what, you see what came out. I'm 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 extremely pleased and get excited every time I watch it. Every time I watch it, you know, I I see different nuances, I see different things, and it's it's a very uh, it's a very powerful powerful piece that highlights African American culture in a place where there's no drinking, there's no shooting, there's no cussing, there's no guns, and nobody's going to jail, and no police. So that's what makes it great. Albert, how, what was it like having this camera crew follow you around? Where were you at the point in your life? And um, someone said, we're doing a movie about the drum corps. This is an organization or a family you grew up with. Um, you know, in the beginning, I was apprehensive to say, to say the least. Um, having a camera crew come in and see the depths of my life, you know, to see what shaped my personality and the man that I am today, um, you know, you have, I had to learn to embrace all that I have been through and use that as, as my superpower because the things that, um, that I've been able to experience, the hardships and the you know, the successes all accumulate to who I am. But I was, I was nervous about uh, sharing information about, about my parents or about growing up in, in West Louisville and, um, you know, the struggles that we went through. Um, they, made, they made it very comfortable for them to be around. Marlon definitely ingratiated himself with, um, with the staff and the families that were participating and, you know, at this time, I was, I was a new parent. My daughter was, you know, one years old, you know, as soon as I moved back to Louisville to take over this position. And at the same time, my mother was, you know, dying from cancer. So I, you know, came home with the dual purpose to really help Mr. White. He asked me to come back and, you know, he didn't really present me being the executive director at first. He just said, I want you to come back and get acclimated with the drum corps. I need you on the team. I want you to help with this uh, strategic plan we're trying to build. You know, we want to create some sustainability. And, you know, being that I came through the program and have a, a very long history with Mr. White, I trust him and I wanted to be around. So, um, just going through those life changes during the filming process, it's really good to look back on the film and see that those those difficult times that I was going through, that I endured them and that we overcame them. And I can look back on, you know, a time that I was nervous and apprehensive. And now um, I see that so many people are um, receiving joy and, and optimism out of, of my story. And my story, not only, but the story of so many young people who have come through our program. And, um, you know, so it's all worth it because it serves as a testimony to the life and the opportunities that we present for our students and what we're able to do uh, with the resources that we're able to get here in, in West Louisville. We want to show uh, another clip um, about growing up in Louisville, and this is Edward White's story. So we're going to start that clip just right now. Growing up in Louisville, I was into art, but I was discouraged from doing that kind of stuff. It 
just wasn't something that, as a child, that I was told that black males did. We built River City Drum Corps to connect children to arts and culture. Our culture is gonna be our savior. If we tap back into that culture, you'll find out that's where the problem is at. We teach African drumming and drumline, but basically what we're talking about in the drum court is life skills. And here we are, 27 years later. to my creator I pledge myself to my creator that I might come to be that I might come to be a harmony with the great purpose in harmony with the great purpose intended for me intended for me I pledge to my ancestors I pledge to my ancestors whose names I may not know whose names I may not know in respect for their great struggle in respect for their great struggle that I might struggle to grow that I might struggle to grow I pledge to my family I pledge to my family a oneness in my soul. A oneness in my soul. A healthy mind. A healthy mind. A body strong. A body strong. Where their love might unfold. Where their love might unfold. That is a powerful, powerful pledge. And I hope we all can live up to it. Um, Marlon, I, I saw you raise your hand um, before I go to Mr. White. Was there something you wanted to add before we sh showed the clip? Oh, I just wanted to say to, Al to Albert's point is that, you know, as storytellers, we intentionally wanted to be good listeners and didn't want to show up and have our, our presence to uh, heavily influence their daily lives. Um, and so there were lots of dinners, there were lots of lunches that we had. We would show up sometimes and not even with a camera crew or a very small camera crew. Um, and if we did our job right, we disappeared. And you know, even though it's probably capturing a routine day and capturing that pledge, I think that's one of the most important parts of this documentary is hearing that pledge. So Mr. White, tell us about what made you decide, I'm starting this drum group, but we're going to be grounded in something. And, and that pledge, what made you decide to have a morning pledge or I was probably after school, a pledge before you started your sessions. Well, it's kind of like you got to be able to set the foundation, you know, because our kids come in from some of the stories and the things that they face in, in a day before we see them, only God knows what they can be. And so therefore, when you put them in a pledge that, give, that gives them an opportunity to forget everything that, that's gone on during the day because now you're here in the something that this belongs to you. Okay, now you, you take ownership. You get the opportunity now to say, this is mine. This is what I'm going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And we are all on this line from from the five-year-old to the 17-year-old are united in, into one, one cohesive group. And that cohesive group is also tied to, to the history and the culture of African-American history and the people that came before them from where we are drawing our strength from, you know, from my grandmother, from my grandfather, from my father, from, uh, Mama Yah, my wife, uh, uh, Ann Grundy, you know, all of, the, all of the, the, the black circle that we had. And so this was just a part of the circle. And so being within that circle, as, as, as I heard this a lot, I'm gonna I'm borrow Albert's word, superheroes, we all became superheroes. You know, no matter how weak you were, no matter how strong you were, your job was to bring the weakest man up or the weakest lady up to, to the strongest woman and to the strongest man so that we could all put ourselves back to back to each other. And we honestly believed that if we said we're going to run through that wall, 
we were going to do it. And so that's, that's what that was about, was building that cohesive group with the foundation that everybody understood what their role was. And the pledge was written by a poet? Yes. And you know what's the funniest thing about that? Every time I laugh, that, that is over 30 years old. So he had been around the country, had been come back from California. And he came back and found out that, he, that we were still using that pledge. And he was so excited. And he said, you know what? I don't even have a copy of it. I said, wow, don't worry oh. about it, brother. I got one for you. So I gave him a copy of, of, of it. So, you know, it was, that was the amazing part for me that, you know, I guess, you know, he's an artist and he does a lot of stuff and he just didn't know where it was and was amazed that it was still being used. Albert, how old were you when you joined the drum corps and when, when you received this pledge, what were you, what did you think of it? How, how did you respond to it? I joined the drum corps when I was eight years old. And so before I joined the drum corps, I was going to the Boys and Girls Club um, like during summer camp every day. So this wasn't something that just the students at the drum corps um, recited. This was something that Mr. White had everyone at the Boys and Girls Club recite. And it was like our morning pledge. We would have a, um, a morning circle amongst all of the kids in the Boys and Girls Club. You have to um, say the pledge, do your stretches. And like any, any eight-year-old or any child, I was averse to um, doing these things, you know. Um, we would rather be doing something else. We'd rather be running around or singing whatever popular song that there was. But, you know, repetition, it was like a seed was being planted. So the longer that I said it, you know, I came back 30 years later and, you know, I realized that all of the things that I spoke in the pledge had helped to create the life that, that I'm actually living today. So we'll talk about your, we'll look at your life um, because that's our next clip. Um, this is Albert's history. We were all into the music. We were all into what was popular and he was trying to show us that we could create the popular culture. So, you know, now, now you can walk around and see people in dashikis and African garb like it's popular now. But back then in 94, in, the, in my neighborhood, we got teased, you know, what you trying to go back to Africa, this, that, and the other, like they, they had the jokes for us. But Mr. Nardi gave us cultural connection, taught us about prominent African-American historical figures that black people contributed a lot to society and a lot to America and the world. He was teaching us this when we were eight, nine, 10 years old, like just empowering us with this information. Basically, we repeated there what you just said. Um, Marlon, you, were, um, you went to an art school. Did you receive that kind of training or? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I, um... Uh, yeah, I went to New World School of the Arts, and I went to Northern Middle, and uh, the neighborhood I grew up in um, was uh, similar to the West End in Liberty City, and, um, you know, there's particular challenges in the local schools, and so it was really a saving grace to be able to go to a performing arts school that really opened up uh, a whole new world, and it made me imagine things that I hadn't otherwise imagined. I had... To a, to a certain extent, you know, uh, society tells folks that kids that look like me know a lot. And then when I got to the art school, I was around people who were never told no and were allowed to be the best versions of themselves. And so um, mm. that is what it was for me. And I'm, I'm just so glad I had a chance when... Uh, Albert and Mr. White came down to Miami to tour, uh, like they toured me of their neighborhood. It was really special. And I remember stories, uh, Mr. White, I mean, I went to an art school, you know, they, for, for a while when you're what they call artsy, you kind, <laughs> you kind of feel like you're on the island of misfit toys. I know you, that you mentioned that the, the track was to put everybody into sports, especially black men, young black men. How did you um, sort of, resist or walk against that, that wind that was coming in your direction? 
Well, I kind of saw my when I when I got to the when I got to the uh, uh, became the director of the boys club. It was like my life just flashed back in front of me. You know, as a child, I I was in the arts, wanted to be in the arts, but never was allowed to do it consistently because I had I had four brothers, but I didn't get the sports gene. I don't know why I didn't get it. I could, you know, it was just something that, you know, I just it, I did it because I had to, and any and any time I got a, a a way to get out of it, I would. Well, where is he at? He's in the art room. Go up there and get him out of the art room. And and I never, never, ever got to finish any of my projects because it was always football practice, basketball practice, baseball practice. And I used to tell him, why are we going? Why we got to do this? We don't win. We, we just, we lose every game. So why, why we got to go through this? And so when I got to Parkland, I walked in the building and I saw everybody sitting in the gym. Everybody's in the gym. There's probably 20 young men on, on the basketball court. And everybody sitting around watching them play. I said, "No, we we're not gonna do this. We we gonna we. This is not a rerun. I'm not gonna let this happen. Be a rerun." And then as I got to uh, start doing my workshops around the city, I went to JCYC, and and every time I'd go in JCYC, there's all the stars, all of them in the hell's going on. So uh, I decided, I decided, no, we're gonna change this narrative. And I guess how I can change it is I get to determine where the money's spent. You know, we had a we had a crack football team and 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 Pop won a football. They won a championship, won the state championship. We ain't got no money. We got to be in Jacksonville. That's twelve thousand uh, dollars. Twelve thousand dollars magically appeared. They won in 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 uh, Jacksonville, and then next thing you know, they had to go to Kansas City. Uh, $8,000 magically appeared. And after that, I said, you know, I'm going to take the heat, but that's what I did. And that was the best move that I ever made because a lot of those children, like Albert came out of that. I got a whole list of children that were successful because they did not have to follow that track of sports that leads most of our men to nowhere. And as much as I hate to say this, George Floyd was a star defensive end coming up, defensive end. But after, after football, after sports, his life just kind of, you know, went away like I see so many young men that get on that athlete, athletic track, it leads them to nowhere, you know? So I said, no, nah, we ain't doing that. So, you know, I did it because I, I, had the, I had the purse, I get to spend the money and that's what I did. And, and I took a lot of flack at first, but when people start seeing the outcomes, the whole, the whole, the whole thing changed. But I, I had to take a lot, you know? We used to have parties. I would give Albert, I would tell Albert to go down to the to the record shop and just buy whatever you want. Whatever, whatever's hot, you buy it. <laughs> Friday nights we'd have parties and he and GI would DJ the parties and and you know, so you know, culture. Let's 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 you know, let the basketball players and y'all can all come in, but Friday night we're gonna have a dance, we're gonna have a party, and we have a good time. Uh, Albert. Um, do you feel that in some ways, like school sort of pigeonhole or limit African American, especially African American men, to certain roles or tracks? You went into music, for example. Um, I think in general, schools limit us on the things that we can focus on. You know, we all get pushed into one track, and a lot of times, teachers um seem to be afraid of, of young black men or seem to not know how to uh, don't have an understanding of where we come from so when i got into middle school 
even though I was an artsy, you know, kid in the back of the classroom making friendship bracelets or, uh, you know, beating on the desk, I, I, I masked my, my artistic side with being a class clown. So I developed somewhat of a reputation of, of a kid that was hard to get along with. And I wanted to join the chorus in, in the seventh grade and the choir director refused me at first. You know, um, she said, I heard you're a class clown and I don't want to deal with you in my class. And it took someone like Miss Zambia to go to the choir director and, you know, plead my case. Miss Zambia was already volunteering at the Boys and Girls Club and um, you know, she was the lady who was walking around in the African clothes in our after school program, but she was, you could tell she was educated, but she had a passion for, for the young people. So she went and talked to her coworker and after she petitioned for me to join the choir, you know, that really changed uh, the direction of my life, being able to um, learn to study music. Um, it, it sent me to college and really, you know, helped me to have this background that I have being classically trained in singing and just having an understanding of, of music in general. So it's it always for youth, they need the right messenger, they need the right cheerleader behind them. And you know, uh, Zambia was, um, was your wife, Mr. White? Um, yes. Tell us how yes. she was involved in, in the um, making of the drum corps. Well, Zambia, Zambia, yes, Zambia was my wife, and Zambia was very instrumental in who I am, because as I was, as I was the director of the, of the Boys and Girls Club, I was, I was a rebel houser, I was working for the Salvation Army, and, you know, and, you know, they are strictly a Christian organization, and, you know, they got a lot of rules and things that they were doing, and, and I was telling them all the time, well, that don't work in the Black community. So, you know, I eventually pulled one button too many times and they fired me, uh, which really turned out to be the best thing that I could do. So I was moping around, you know, uh, never got fired. That's something that my family didn't do. I, to this day, uh, my mother, ne I never told her. I never told her that I got fired, never, because it, it, it just it just wasn't a flu. And so Zambia said, I don't know why you're moping around here complaining and, and 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 don't come out of your house she said you can do this for yourself so one day I showed up at her I showed up at her her classroom just to get her off my back and uh, I started doing this workshop and then Albert and my son and JR they they wouldn't go away you know and so they turned my house into a a drum corps. And so from there, then, yeah, they turned my house a drum corps. Many days I would just leave and say, just don't tear up the house, you know? And so they would, you know, uh, they would drum. And then, and then Zambia's mother said, I heard you got them kids in your house beating on them drums. I uh, 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 got them in that, in that station wagon, dragging them all over the city. I said, yeah. She said, well, you know what? I need you to go over at McHart and Mary. That building sitting over there was empty. So I went over there, she went along with me. And then from there, it, it, it started snowballing. And then she taught me how to write grants. And I thought, cause she, she wasn't my wife then, she was my friend. We were just associates. She made a passes at me and I never took one of them because her friendship was more important to me. And so she's, she, made me, she made me write, taught me how to write papers, write all of my papers with red marks, it was like, Damn, I'm not in your, I'm not, I'm not your student. Yeah, well, yeah, you are. So from, from there, from her guidance and, and, and with my artistic thoughts, she was able to guide me to be able to take my thoughts that were scattered and put them into one spot. And then after she did that, then, you know, all of my thoughts and dreams now had a foundation and, you know, just one thing led to another. One thing led to another, and 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 but the ironic thing about it, I did all of my work in Eastern Kentucky before I before Louisville realized who I was, and then when Louisville realized, I came back and and they saw the power of what we were doing, and the rest is history. But it was because of her guidance, saying you you can do this for yourself. 
Well, that's, that's a good segue into talking about women in the drum corps, because obviously the drum corps, the River City is, drum is, corps is a woman's touch, right? It's a it's woman's Lord. touch. And you know, funny, before you go to the woman's court, every woman, every girl that came into the drum corps when Albert and, and the group was eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, they ran them away. Every last one of them. Every last oh. one of them. But one that didn't run away was Imani. So we're going to see Imani in the next clip. Okay, so start over. Everybody get a neutral three. So it'll be Jaden, Gabe, Caden, and then it will go into the clicks. All right, great job. Put up. Thank you all. Imani, I remember when she was born, and now Imani's getting ready to graduate from high school. You know, it went like that. When I first came to River City Drum Corps, I was having trouble finding myself. My sixth grade year was kind of weird. It was rocky. It was unstable. I was in the principal's office all the time. <laughs> Mr. White always instilled in me leadership. Who are you going to be? You need to step up. interesting though being a female drummer people are always kind of like what you can really do that you can really be on beat like no you can't I'm just like yeah I can yeah I drum so what hey shame on you Albert chasing <laughs> chasing the girls away but you know here we have today we can claim Sheila E Cindy Blackman Santana, Emily yeah. Estefan. Mm -hmm. yes. They're among the bold faced women percussionists today. Yes. What gets the girls and young women like Imani hooked on drum corps? And how do you get them to stay? Albert, we'll start with you since you chased them away. <laughs> you know, um, I think what allows, what makes the girls want to stay is it, there's an equal playing field. A girl who plays the drums can challenge a boy. It's not about your size or your strength. It's really about your artistic ability and your imagination. And when the girls in our program start to drum, they take ownership of it. You know, now a lot of the leadership amongst the drum corps are young women. You see Imani here, um, she really took to the process. She's now studying to be a music teacher but in middle school and in high school, she was able to work, uh, work as a as a, like a, an assistant to Mr. White teaching. And you see, like in her junior and senior year, she was able to run classes on her own and work as a summer job. But that started with Stephanie McKinney. So once um, once girls got into the program, they started to rise to the top. First there was Stephanie. Then you have uh, my sister Brandy Shoemake, and you got. So many of these young women who've been able to come through our program and go to uh, college and play on marching band drum lines and, you know, really show that that there is like girl power. So now, um, you know, we have in, in traditional like HBCU culture, there are not a lot of women snare players, uh, women like in the primary, you know, prominent instruments on the drum line. But we, we are changing the culture for that because our girls do it all from the cymbals to the bass drum and everything in between. And Marlon, you and um, Anne were mm -hmm. really keen about featuring a young woman's story. Yes. Oh, yeah, we, um, we decided early on that we wanted to make sure there was female representation because we saw it and we wanted to tell that truth. And that also speaks to the power of diversity and hiring, you know, um, and being a female director 
uh, brought certain things to the table, certain sensitivities that I may have had a small, a bit of a blind spot. I am a father of four girls, so I like to think I'm pretty, I understand a lot of the nuances, but definitely having a, a diverse creative team was to our advantage. Well, we want to, I want to show another clip because I want to talk about the challenges of doing drum corps now during COVID and kids out of school. So we're going to show a clip of what life was like um, before March anyway. Um, so let's cue this bus ride to the showcase. saw there Jalen, who is also one of the featured graduating seniors, along with Imani, who are from the drum corps. Um, Albert, I'll start with you. Um, we were on this topic of with the school closings, and also the drum corps has had to discontinued in-person rehearsals and meetups. How are you keeping the youth connected and focused? Uh, and also, you know, with things going on in Louisville re related to Breonna Taylor's killing and the Black Lives Matter protests? You know, um, it's very difficult for us to um, work right now because we cannot meet in person. So we've been able to pivot and do a lot of things virtually. So we have held uh, weekly gatherings on our Zoom for our students so that they have at least an opportunity to socialize, to see each other and to communicate. Um, you know, when the pandemic first began, we did a couple of arts and craft workshops where our students were able to make um, drum like practice pads out of uh, phone books and duct tape so that they could interact and practice at home without making too much noise. Um, we gave our students some art arts and craft kits so that we could participate together and make, you know, do some art, make some projects as a group. And with the, the racial uh, tension that's going on in the city um, with the police and, and city government, we, we've realized that our students have 
feelings and thoughts about what's going on. And we have done our best to create a platform for them to uh, get their thoughts out. So we've done open-ended questions where our students have written essays talking about what it feels like to be um, a young Black person during this time, how they feel about the protest movement, what does Black Lives Matter mean to them, you know, what it feels like for a student to be um, at home during the pandemic and having to transition um, with, with their schoolwork and how they're coping with it because no one is highlighting how young people feel. You can't turn on the television and see the perspective of a 13 year old or, or of an eight year old. You know, the adults are doing the talking, but um, we want our kids to know that their feelings are valid and their opinions and thoughts about what's going on need to be spoken and heard. So we've done our best to create a platform for that. And with um, the, the state of the world, you know, everyone is shut down. Arts organizations are scrambling, trying to figure out how they're going to survive. We have, you know, received some, you know, financial assistance for, through many agencies that want to see what we do continue. So as we move forward, we know that school is going to be on a at least six week uh, non-traditional uh, instructional period. So we'll be setting up a master class series with our students, bringing in artists from, you know, many disciplines so that our students can at least, um, you know, so that we can fulfill our mission, which is to connect our families and youth to arts, culture and education through the spirit of the drum. You know, the drumming is only part of what we do, but um, if we're able to still, you know, capture the minds and the and the spirit of our students and get them working creatively, then we're still able to, you know, perform our mission. Marlon, speaking of working creatively, what are some of the challenges you're now facing as a filmmaker? I know that um, part of the, a lot of the plans for this film were just, just evaporated with the COVID crisis. Yeah, I, I still feel blessed. Um, we were able to have a wonderful premiere at Doc NYC last year and it was, three screenings sold out, um, one of which was a group of high school performing arts kids. And uh, it was about as a great a reception as uh, we've ever received. And then we did Miami as well, which was, was magical in its own way. So I don't want to get too down about uh, missing out on so much. I, I remain blessed to have a house full of uh, four girls that I'm taking care of and they're all healthy. But that being said, I don't think enough is being talked about uh, about filmmakers right now. And uh, I mean, all of the arts, but specifically film, there aren't any more films being made. You know, everybody's getting to the end of Netflix. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and so I have a community uh, that is really trying to figure out what we're going to do, both in the commercial world, both in the fictional world, both in the documentary world. We're best positioned because we, we have small crews, we can do archival, footage, um, things of that nature, which, which, we're, which I'm pivoting to. Um, we've done remote shoots, uh, which are interesting. I've done Zoom directed uh, shoots. We had, I'm doing something on dance hall and we had a crew in Jamaica that um, you know, had a Zoom and took my directions and um, that was interesting. So we are all artists and we adapt and uh, we are adapting. I think the other really exciting thing, Mashan, and you're, you're part of this is um, with the virtual theatrical releases now, it is allowing us to go directly to the consumer. There aren't as many gatekeepers as there used to be now. And so um, we as producers and as directors have taken some of that power back, which is exciting. Um, Ann and I were last night on, a, on a, a particular platform where we could reach the theater and we see all the ticket prices, all the sales, and we control everything, the language, what it looks like, what poster we want. And I was like, this is the future for now. And it's very exciting. Mr. White, speaking of um, everyone pivoting, what has been going on where you are? You're, you're now pivoting to be a visual artist. Yes. Yes, I am pivoting to be a visual artist. And, and with that, 
I get to fulfill some of the things that I did not have the opportunity to do. See, so it's like. <laughs> now they look like eyes when you put them up in front of your eyes. Yes, yes, <laughs> Tell us yes. what we're looking at. Yes, yes, you know, and I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at, you know, just different things that I've been able to do. I've been able to do now that I, I, I can do art. I can, I'm building a shed. I can go out to my shed and, and uh, you know, within by, by winter, I'll be in my shed. I don't have to talk to nobody. And now with COVID, you know, it gives me, a, it gives me a haven. It gives me a haven to go ahead and do what I never could do as a child because I was always told that black man can't make no money doing art doing that stupid stuff, you know? So now I get to do it. And now I see so many other black artists that are, you know, thriving, doing their work. I've got a young, I've got one of my young mentors who went to Savannah, uh, Savannah School for Art. Mm -hmm. And he's working with Disney now, you know? And, and we would always talk to his mother and, 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 and we was in agreement. And they would always say, you gonna let him do that? And we're gonna say, yeah, that's that's what he's gonna do, you know, because look at you football players. Y'all has been broke down. Now we sitting around telling stories and playing video games and 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 you know, trying to relive your life. But now I get to do something new. I get to to discover. You know, I was always an adventurer. So now through my art, I get to be able to to do it. And can't nobody tell me that I can't. And that is the greatest. Nobody can tell me that I cannot do it. And so that is my pivot. And I am really, truly enjoying that pivot, for real. One of the things I love in the documentary is the visit in Ed Hamilton's studio. He's a sculptor and, and he has yeah. a very famous piece in DC, the Black Civil, Civil War Memorial um, yes. for the Union soldiers. And he's done many works that some of you in this audience who are attending now may be familiar with. So we, we get a peek inside Ed, Ed Hamilton's studio and he's a good friend of Mr. White's. Yeah. See where the Joe Lewis bust is, the, the, the dark yes. bust right up there? Right over here? Yeah, see a red figure? Yes. Pick him up carefully and bring him up here. Yes, sir. Don't drop him. Don't, don't you, don't you, uh, uh, I'm going to disown you, son. <laughs> don't worry. 12th grade, Shawnee High School. When I got in art class, I never knew that I could do this because I never did any clay work like this before. Mm -hmm. But somehow, this happened. And this is what my art teachers saw. Oh, shit. Hmm. That boy got something. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Now, somebody had to be able to say, you got something. Exactly. And now I got to help get that. Exactly. Out there. Exactly. That's what you do. When children come in here, mm -hmm. they come in here all, you know, you know, and all, all right, this looking around. On. You know, here, 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 Albert, my man, here, take this bottle. Take this bottle. <laughs> spray this, spray, spray, down, spray him down, spray him down. You remember that? We were just in the neighborhood, leaving mm -hmm. Shelby Park or something like that. Uh, I'm about to show you something. Come on over here. <laughs> and we knock on the door and we come in. It was a Civil War piece. Yeah. And he just hands me a bottle of water. That's what I'm working on. Here, spray it. The way I can get you to understand going from a wax figure to a bronze. You're gonna take that wax, dip it in the slurry, dip it in the sand. You take that, put it in a furnace, and you burn out the wax. Now you know who was doing this. <laughs> I ain't it's talking gonna, China. It's either. gonna blow your mind when you tell you who was the, doing the this. Benin, <laughs> your people. <laughs> this was way back, baby. <laughs> so I'm just a part of the the legacy of that. Our children, when they walk outside and see a piece out there, well, they don't know how that piece got up there. Who did that? Mm -hmm. How'd that get here? Yeah. Not knowing that they, that Mr. Nardi can knock on the door and show you the person who made it because he he's still right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the time we're going to take some questions. Um, some questions came before tonight's event. 
And so I'm going to read them and then assign them. Um, one is, um, I, I'll direct this to Marlon, and I'm paraphrasing. If you started filming this film last fall, how do you, how do you think this story would have evolved or turned out, especially um, cons considering what's going on now with the current pandemic? Um, would you have changed direction? Um, well, if we would have started, Mr. White would have since retired. So it would have been a completely different story. It would have been, uh, I guess, about Albert's first year and how he has evolved. Um, but what was so pivotal was that we were catching Mr. White, announcing his retirement, and then that transition. So I think that's the biggest part of if we were to film, say, last fall, is that that important handing off of a baton or continuing a legacy would not have been as clear a storyline. And that's paramount to this picture, that rich tradition, which we all have a part in. I have a part in, Albert has a part in, Mr. White has done his part. And so that to me um, would be the, the biggest change. Now we've gotten two questions related to the North-South thing. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna try to combine them into one. Um, someone says that I am from the tradition of Southern Black school bands. How is this just opposed to the Northern experience in America? And then someone asks, could you see a drum line on the Harvard or Yale campus? Mr. White. <laughs> I'm gonna touch that one. <laughs> well, on the Harvard and Yale campus, I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say no because it's not part of their culture. And I'm not saying that they can't do it, but you know, we what what you saw is who we are, and so it would take too long to explain to explain what it is. And 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 see, they have they have music, they have bands, but the traditions are different. You know, their traditions is straight is strictly to the the note as it is. But what Africans do, they take a, they take a, whatever the note is, and they put the culture on top of it. So that's, you know, it's just like the imp, imp, improvisation. So you know, that's all black music is, and the bands is improvisation. The show is party, we having a good time. Whereas northern is, you know, everybody's rigid. It's a B flat. It's gonna be a B flat, and don't you change it. So maybe this is something you can't, don't always learn in school, that it has to come from the home or somebody in the community who is relocated. Like so, yeah. it's just- And I'm, I'm proud of Mr. White for answering that question without getting any, us in trouble. <laughs> I'm teasing. Okay, so Albert, um, we had a question about um, arts groups and support. Um, where are you finding support for the River City Drum Corps in the cultural and arts community for your space, for venues to perform? Um, I guess we're looking pre-March or where, you know, after this pandemic passes, you know, who, what is your support? Our support, um, we, we rely on the support of private donors, of metro government, of, you know, small funding organizations here in the city. A lot of the funding that we have is built on the 30 year history and legacy that Mr. White has built. So he's been knocking doors down, you know, showing that there is value for arts groups here in West Louisville. You know, um, we're looking for every opportunity to write a grant. We're looking for every opportunity for a donor to see the value in our program and make a donation so that um, we can continue doing the work that we do. And, you know, we do require a very small um, registration fee, membership fee for our families that participate. So, you know, we, we expect our families to have some type of investment, as Mr. White would call it, skin in the game. And then we spend the rest of our time um, beating doors down, making sure that funders and people of resources make sure that they are um, putting the money where their mouth is when they say they want to give back and see changes happen for kids in our neighborhood. I think this is a good um, final question because we're always talking about media images and, and the, the power of the image. So 
Wow. Someone asked, how has the drum corps program, what is the impact on the kids and the people of African ancestry, I guess that's your community, given the, the proliferation of negative images and messages in US media and otherwise? And maybe that's also um, a question for you, Marlon. What, do, what kind of impact do you hope this film will have, especially for kids and people of African ancestry? So we'll start. Well, I'll, I, I'll answer it in two folds. I hope that um, for kids of African ancestry, they can look at this film and see and be proud. Uh, be proud and, and have it justify the work that they're each doing in their own community and let them know that they can dream big and to not take no for an answer. And for those who don't live in communities that look like the ones that we have in the film, I hope that this film helps them to reimagine the narrative they have of communities like that. And Mr. White, how has this program, you've seen the whole history for 30 years. How, how would you say this program has had an impact on the West End and the kids of the West End? Well, what, what the impact has had is it, it shows, number one, that our children can, can rise to the occasion. Our children can, can get rid of the negative stereotypes. Our children can be leaders. Our children can be disciplined. That our families can come together and support their children. So it, it's a total win because it, it Terribly, I mean, I would always tell Ivor, what we're getting ready to do is we're getting ready to destroy the myths. Hmm. And the River City Drum Corps destroys all of the myths that they say about black children. They can't, we can't be on time. We can't be organized. We, we, we can't follow directions. We can't be disciplined. You know, there can't be an event where there's guns, drugs, shootings, and crazy stuff. So that's what we've been able to do because when the people know River City Drum Corps is coming, it's going to be tight and it's going to be right. And there's going to be no issues. Albert, from this moment forward, as, an, as the executive director and for a new generation, um, what, is, what do you see as this, the impact? What do you want the impact to be? The impact that I want to be seen is that um, there is value that comes out of these forgotten communities. You know, um, they say that nothing good can come out of Parkland. Nothing good can come out of the West End. And, you know, Mr. White has, has done an excellent job of showing not only me, but so many other young people what the possibilities are by introducing us to artists and professionals, people from all over the world. And I think when people see this film, they will see what that does for the mind of a young person. And I will do my best to continue to do that so that um, kids have a very large palette of things that they can choose from that they can, uh, you know, strive to be, strive to achieve, and then give that same example back to their community for those who come under them. Okay, I think that's going to be our final question. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions this evening, but it's now one hour and we, they said we only had an hour. But I wanna thank Marlon Johnson, Edward White, Al, Albert Shoemake. Did I get, get that right, Shumak? Shoemake, no, you were correct, thank you. Shoemake, I got it right the first time because I, I'm always tempted to put Gurr at the end but um i thank you all i just have loved working with you all we're you know we're not going away all of us but i want to remind the attendees that the virtual theatrical run of river city drumbeat starts tomorrow you can still watch it i think tonight if you signed up for this event but um that's going that window is going to close pretty soon and also I wanna thank the Massachusetts African American History Museum and everyone who's, who put together this event, WGBH. And um, I hope you all will get a chance to see River City Drumbeat. There's a link to a review that just came out in the New York Times and there are many other great reviews from other 
outlets and newspapers. So definitely look on the website to read those and be safe, be, be well. And um, I have to mention this and just vote <laughs> in November. Vote. So, vote. <laughs> change America, change the world, vote. Okay, well, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you for having us. Hope to see you again. God bless. You.